Our Humanities Librarian, and it is, as always, my privilege to welcome you to an Authors at MIT series event on behalf of the staff of the MIT Press Bookstore and John Jenkins, a manager of the Press Bookstore and the MIT Libraries. Tonight, oh, the Authors at MIT series is a series of celebrations of book-length publications by MIT faculty or staff and occasionally a pertinent MIT press book not authored by an MIT author. Uh, tonight we are here, as you know, to showcase uh, the new book by Steve Pinker, who is the current Peter de Flores uh, Professor of Psychology here at MIT. And to introduce Professor Pinker, we have the Peter de Flores Emeritus Professor, Samuel J. Kaiser, which I think should be a special treat. I know it will be for me. For, in my opinion, Jay Kaiser is the preeminent Renaissance man here at MIT. He is an accomplished linguist, administrator, poet, musician, and chronicler of his world's travels and adventures therein. He has two new books, one just published by the MIT Press and co-authored by the late Professor Kenneth L. Hale, entitled Proglamenon to a Theory of Argument Structure. And just to prove my Renaissance man remark, his next book to be published next year by Front Street Books is written for children and will be called The Pond God and Other Stories. Please welcome Professor Kaiser. Thank you all. Uh, can everybody hear me? I've known uh, Steve Pinker ever since he came to MIT in 1979 uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for Cognitive Science. Uh, in the course of the last 23 years, I've watched with admiration as he's gone from a talented young researcher to the country's leading voice in bringing cognitive science to an intelligent lay public. And by intelligent lay public, I include my colleagues here at MIT. <laughs> Just two days ago, I attended the Emeriti professor's lunch. I was sitting next to Asher Shapiro, who's been retired for several years now. And Asher asked me if I'd ever read uh, The Language Instinct. I said I had, and he commented on what a terrific writer the author was. He wanted to know if I knew him. This is actually not an infrequent uh, question. Uh, Teresa mentioned that I'm uh, a musician and a couple of weeks ago I was at a jazz festival in Alexandria Bay, New York. Uh, it's a sleepy little resort town uh, in the Thousand Lakes region. It's just across uh, the border from Canada and it's only about two and a half hours car drive from the town that Steve was uh, born in and grew up in, Montreal. One morning at breakfast, one of the guests, his name was Bert Joss, had heard that I was from MIT. He wanted to know if I knew Steve Pinker. I said, yeah, I did. He asked me to convey this message, which I'm doing now. <laughs> his daughter, Susan, went to Edinburgh School with your sister. <laughs> and he knows your mother and father, and he sends you all his regards. <laughs> there are many reasons why Steve has become what one writer called, quote, the new age guru for the machinery of thought. One of those reasons is surely his hair. He is a member of the luxuriant flowing hair club for scientists. <laughs> I want you to know that I deeply resent that. <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> I do acknowledge, however, that there is a connection between Steve's hair and the strength of his scholarship. I think of him more as a Samson than a guru. And I urge you, don't get a haircut, Steve. <laughs> um, there are other reasons for Steve's 
meteoric rise to national prominence. Here's four of them. The Language Instinct, 1940, 1994. How the Mind Works, 1997. Words and Rules, 1999. And his latest book, The Blank Slate, 2002. His productivity at the rate of one book every two and a half years is extraordinary. Anyone who takes the time and trouble to read these very readable volumes will not only have acquired a crash course in what cognitive science has been able to tell us about how the mind works, but will also have taken the pill with a spoonful of very stylish sugar. Consider, for example, the opening paragraph of chapter three of the blank slate. In 1755, Samuel Johnson wrote that his dictionary should not be expected to, quote, change sublunary nature and clear the world at once from folly, vanity, and affectation, end quote. Few people today are familiar with the lovely word, word sublunary, literally below the moon. It alludes to the ancient belief in a strict division between the pristine, lawful, unchanging cosmos above and our grubby, chaotic, fickle earth below. The division was already obsolete when Johnson used the word. Newton had shown that the same force that pulled an apple toward the ground kept the moon in its celestial orbit. That paragraph just about sums up a thousand years of intellectual history in one elegant production. Gems like that are awaiting the attentive reader, and I urge you to it. I think Steve's book comes at an auspicious time. At any rate, I'm someone who is inclined to think about that, to think that something is auspicious when I hear human nature being discussed in the context of Hollywood films. Just the other day, Tim Blake Nelson was being interviewed on NPR. He's the actor who played Bubba in The Good Girl, and he was Delmar in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And he uh, just wrote and directed a new film called The Gray Zone, uh, it is an account of concentration camp Jews, the so-called Zonderkommandos, Jewish units in Auschwitz who cooperated with the Nazis to help exterminate other Jews to save their own lives. In the course of the interview, Blake said something to the effect that the film was a commentary on human nature, whether it was essentially Lockean or Hobbesian. That is, whether it is a blank slate or one predisposed to being nasty and brutish. He opted for the latter. Steve's book makes it clear what these choices really come down to with an extraordinarily interesting account of the intellectual wars surrounding the question of human nature of the last quarter century. It is both fascinating and disquieting reading. But there is another more pressing reason why I think Steve's book is so timely. In 1960, Carl Jung, the great psychologist, wrote a letter in response to a request that he participate in a world conference on peace. The request came from a man who was a designer of missiles to deliver nuclear warheads. Here in part is Jung's reply to that request, and I quote, the jungle is in us, in our unconscious, and we have succeeded in projecting it into the outside world where now the Saurians are lustily playing about again in the form of cars, airplanes, and rockets. If a psychologist should participate in your world conference, he would be up against the thankless task to make his colleagues from other disciplines see where they have the blind spot. The human mind will sacrifice everything for a new gadget but will carefully refrain from a look into himself. Steve's latest book will go a long way toward illuminating the blind spot that Jung so presciently identified a half century ago. The blank slate has relicensed serious inquiry into human nature as an important, perhaps the most important item on the agenda of those who, like myself, are interested in understanding how 350 cc's of gray matter arose in the savannas of sub-Saharan sub Africa and managed to go from napping quartz 
hand axes to the Big Bang in just 100,000 short years. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a great colleague and friend, Steven Pinker. Thank you very much, Jay, for that very kind introduction. This is the fourth uh, trade book that I've uh, written and uh, engaged in an author publicity tour for, and in each case, the high point of speaking about the book is coming back to MIT and discussing it with my colleagues, friends, and, and students. So thank you very much, the MIT Press Bookstore, for arranging this event, and thanks to all of you for coming. People often ask me what it's like uh, to be on an, a uh, book tour, and I think it's best uh, captured in the following cartoon. Uh, yes, a lot of people ask me that. The restroom is down the hall on the right. <laughs> the Blank Slate is a book about uh, human nature, and a starting point for this topic is realizing that everyone needs a theory of human nature. Everyone has to anticipate how other people will behave in their surroundings, and that means all of us need theories, explicit or implicit, about what makes people tick. So much depends on our theory of human nature. In our personal lives, we use it to win friends and influence people, to bring up our children, to control our own behavior. Its assumptions about learning guide our policies in education, its assumptions about motivation guide our policies in law. And because a theory of human nature delineates what we can achieve easily, what we can achieve only with pain and suffering, and what we cannot achieve at all, it affects our values, what we think we can reasonably strive for as individuals and as a society. Because of this tie to values, it comes as no surprise that for thousands of years, the dominant theory of human nature in our intellectual tradition was intimately tied to religion. And in fact, the Judeo-Christian uh, intellectual tradition encompassed a theory of human nature which made commitments about what we would today consider to be the subject matter of psychology. It was a modular theory. That is, it assumed that people come equipped with a capacity for love, a moral sense that presents us with standards of right and wrong, and a decision or choice faculty, a free will, that uh, allows us to choose behavior uh, in conformity to these standards. And although our free will is not part of the world of cause and effect, it is uh, truly free, it has an innate tendency to choose sin. Uh, it has a, the Judeo-Christian theory has a theory of perception and cognition embedded in it, that our faculties keep us in touch with the world because God is no deceiver and he desi designed them to keep us uh, in touch with reality. And it even has a theory of mental health, that mental health comes from uh, accepting God's purpose, loving God, and loving our fellow human beings for the sake of God. Now, the Judeo-Christian theory uh, emerged out of an interpretation of particular events narrated in the Bible. For example, the doctrine of free will comes from the story in which Adam and Eve were punished for eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which implies that they could have chosen otherwise, therefore, free will must exist. Now today, no scientifically literate person can believe that the events narrated in the book of Genesis actually took place. And that uh, opened up a gap uh, for a new theory of human nature uh, with the de decline of biblical literalism. And a principal argument of the blank slate is that this secular theory of human nature is based on three doctrines each of them associated with a dead white European male. <laughs> uh, the first one is the theory of the blank slate, or the tabula rasa, commonly associated with this man, the English philosopher John Locke. Uh, now, all of Locke's works are now available on the internet, and a search reveals that he actually never used the expression, the blank slate, or the tabula rasa, but he did say something similar. Here's what Locke wrote. Let us suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? 
Whence comes it by that vast store which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted on it with an almost endless variety? Whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer in one word from experience. Now, in Locke's time and in ours, the blank slate had a great deal of uh, emotional appeal. It implied that dogmas, such as the divine right of kings, could not be treated as self-evident truths, but had to be justified by experiences that people shared and therefore could debate. It undermined a hereditary royalty and aristocracy who could claim no inherent wisdom or, or virtue if their minds started out as blank as everyone else's. And by the same token, it undermined the institution of slavery uh, because slaves could no longer be considered to be innately inferior or subservient. And this idea, this set of ideas is captured by a, uh, a lovely cartoon that I clipped out of the New Yorker about eight years ago, where one king says to the other, I don't know anything about the bell curve, but I say heredity is everything. <laughs> now, we continue to see an influence of the blank slate in modern intellectual life. In most of the 20th century, psychology tried to explain all human behavior through a, a few simple mechanisms of association and conditioning. In the social sciences, culture and socialization has often been used as the uh, only explanatory construct for human experience. And I'll give you uh, one example of this from a, a well-known anthropologist. With the exception of the instinctoid reactions in infants to sudden withdrawals of support and to sudden loud noises, the human being is entirely instinctless. Man is man because he has no instincts, because everything he is and has become, he has learned, acquired from his culture, from the man-made part of the environment, from other human beings. And that is a quote from the anthropologist and public intellectual uh, Ashley Montague. Uh, but the influence goes beyond uh, scholars and universities and is spread to the culture at large. Here's another statement of the blank slate from a public intellectual. I think of a child's mind as a blank book. During the first years of his life, much will be written on the pages. The quality of that writing will affect his life profoundly. And that is a quote from Walt Disney. <laughs> and uh, here's, I'll give you one more. When kids go to school at the age of six, there's an empty bucket there, and someone, by the time they're 18, will fill that bucket. Is it going to be a parent? Is it going to be a good educator? Or is it going to be some other scum out there who's going to fill that bucket? <laughs> Now, there's another doctrine that often accompanies the blank slate. Uh, and the, my, uh, the name that I'll use for it comes from a poem by John Dryden called The Conquest of Grenada, in which he wrote, I am as free as nature first made man, ere the base laws of servitude began, when wild in woods the noble savage ran. Now, the noble savage is more commonly associated with this gentleman, the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And here's what Rousseau wrote. So many authors have hastily concluded that man is naturally cruel and requires a regular system of police to be reclaimed, whereas nothing can be more gentle than him in his primitive state. The more we reflect on this state, the more convinced we shall be that it was the best for man and that nothing could have drawn him out of it but some fatal accident which should never have happened. The example of the savages seems to confirm that mankind was formed ever to remain in this condition, that it is the real youth of the world and that all ulterior improvements have been so many steps in appearance towards the perfection of individuals, but in fact towards the decrepitness of the species. Now, you can never understand someone, especially in a uh, different century, unless you know who he was arguing against. And in the case of Rousseau, uh, his foil was this gentleman who wrote, Hereby it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war, and such a war is of every man against every man. In such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, no commodious building, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This, of course, is the famous quotation from Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. <clears throat> now, the doctrine of the noble savage had a, also had a great deal of emotional appeal. It implied that there was no need for a domineering Leviathan, 
a government and police force to keep us from each other's throats. If we're basically nasty, then conflict is a permanent part of the human condition and we have to get used to it. If on the other hand we're basically noble, then we can work for a utopian society of the future. Children are born savages, that is uncivilized, so if the inner savage in us is nasty, it means that child rearing is, a dis is an arena of discipline and conflict, whereas if the inner savage in us is noble, it means that childhood, uh, child rearing consists of providing children with opportunities to develop their potential. Uh, we continue to see an influence of the doctrine of the noble savage in modern intellectual life. We see it in the respect for everything green and organic and a distrust of anything man-made. It's in natural uh, childbirth, natural medicines, natural foods. We see it in the unfashionability of authoritarian styles of child rearing. And we see it uh, in an understanding of our social problems as repairable defects in our institutions uh, in, uh, in contrast to a traditional view in which they would be seen as part of the inherent tragedy of the human condition. And there's a third doctrine that accompanies the blank slate and the noble savage, commonly associated with this man, the philosopher René Descartes. Descartes wrote, when I consider my mind, I cannot distinguish any parts, but apprehend it to be clearly one and entire. The faculties of willing, feeling, conceiving, etc., cannot be said to be its parts, for it is one and the same mind which employs itself in willing and in feeling and in understanding. But it is quite otherwise with corporeal objects, for there is not one of them imaginable by me which my mind cannot easily divide into parts. This is sufficient to teach me that the mind or soul of man is entirely different from the body, a doctrine which three centuries later would be derided as the doctrine of the ghost in the machine. Uh, and the man who coined that was Gilbert Ryle. It was not coined by the police, even though they used it as the title of one of their albums. <clears throat> The ghost in the machine has a great deal of emotional appeal. Uh, we don't like to think of ourselves as just glorified uh, hunks of machinery. Machines are insensate, built to be used and disposable. Humans are sentient, possessing of dignity and rights and precious. Machines have some workaday purpose, like grinding corn or sharpening pencils. Humans, we like to think, have a higher purpose, such as love, worship, and the pursuit of knowledge and beauty. Machines follow the ineluctable laws of physics, whereas behavior is freely chosen. With choice comes optimism about possibilities for the future. And with choice also comes responsibility and the power to hold people accountable for their actions. Finally, if the mind, as Descartes suggested, is entirely separate from the body, that holds out the hope that the mind can survive the death of the body, an idea whose appeal I think is all too obvious. Uh, like the other two doctrines, we continue to feel the uh, impact of the ghost in the machine. We see it in the fact that freedom, dignity, and responsibility are often seen as incompatible with a biological view of the mind, which is often denounced as reductionist or determinist. Now, no one really knows what these words mean, but everyone knows that they refer to something bad. <laughs> we see it in the stem cell debate, where some of the theologians advising uh, George W. Bush on stem cell research claim that it should be outlawed because harvesting stem cells from five-day-old blastocysts occurs after the moment of insolment uh, and therefore is tantamount to murder, uh, which means that perhaps the most promising medical technology of the 21st century is being debated in terms of when the ghost first enters the machine. And we see it in everyday thinking and speech as when we uh, talk about John's brain, which seems to presuppose some other entity, John, that's separate from the brain that it owns. Or when we see journalists speculate about brain transplants, whereas, in fact, they really should call them body transplants, because as Dan Dennett once pointed out, this is the one transplant operation in which you really want to be the donor, not the recipient. <laughs> well, it should come as no surprise that I think that these, these doctrines uh, are deeply flawed, beginning with the blank slate. And the fundamental problem with, uh, with the doctrine is that blank slates don't do anything. The inscriptions would just sit there forever unless there was some innate capacity to interpret their 
meaning to combine them with other inscriptions, and to use them to organize behavior in uh, pursuit of goals. No one denies the central importance of learning, socialization, and culture in all aspects of human life. The only question is, how do they work? And when Locke said there is nothing in the intellect that was not first in the senses, I think the ultimate riposte came from Leibniz when he said, except for the intellect itself. Um, and indeed, the uh, modern sciences of mind, I think, have posed a number of threats to the blank slate uh, for these reasons. My own field, cognitive science, has uh, tried to spell out how many innate mechanisms you need to do the learning that human beings undeniably do. They would include some kind of concept of an object and of causation, a number sense that allows us to uh, conceptualize numbers separate from the entities they uh, enumerate, a set of spatial representations that the brain uses to keep track of where things are and allow us to navigate in, in uh, the world, a theory of mind or intuitive psychology that allows us to infer the thoughts and feelings of other people, a language instinct that allows us to communicate uh, our thoughts to others, and executive systems of the frontal lobes that integrate information from other parts of the brain and uh, carry out reasoning and decision making. Evolutionary psychology has undermined the blank slate by uh, documenting human universals. Now, though it is uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly true that there are uh, very important differences among cultures, uh, which anthropology has called to our attention, uh, in addition, there is a bedrock of uh, human universals, patterns of thought and feeling that can be found in all human beings. The anthropologist Donald Brown has recently tried to catalog uh, universal traits as documented by ethnography, and he's found some, so far some 300 of them, everything from aesthetics, affection, ambivalence, and antonyms, all the way down to verbs, violence, visiting, vowel contrasts, weaning weapons, attempts to control the, the weather and the color white. Now, evolutionary psychology has undermined the blank slate in, in a, another way by showing that many human drives can't be understood as ways that people maximize their happiness and well-being, but rather are, can only be understood as uh, adaptations to an ancestral environment, the one that we evolved in, in uh, and are designed to pursue evolutionary goals. An obvious example is our taste for sugar and fat, which sends many people to an early grave uh, with, uh, from eating too much junk food, but which was clearly adaptive in an environment in which these uh, nutrients were in short supply and so one could never get too much of them. Very recently, we've invented technologies that can crank out mass quantities of the stuff. Our tastes have not caught up, uh, and we therefore eat more of them than are good for us. Another example is the uh, thirst for revenge, which has led to enormous suffering in the forms of vendettas and blood feuds and cycles of violence, but which was uh, one's only defense in a world in which one couldn't dial 911 to get the Leviathan to show up when one was threatened but a willingness to retaliate with violence and a reputation for toughness was the uh, only defense against becoming a permanent punching bag. And less obviously, uh, I think it um, explains our paradoxical desire for attractive mates. Now, the humorist Fran Lebowitz, I think, once made an insightful observation about our psychology. She said, people who marry someone that they're attracted to are making a terrible mistake. You should really marry your best friend you like your best friend more than you're apt to like anyone you happen to be physically attracted to. You wouldn't pick your best friend because they have a cute nose, but that's all you do, you're doing when you're getting married. You're saying, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with you because of your lower lip. <laughs> now, this indeed is a paradox, uh, but I think it's resolved by uh, research in, from evolutionary psychology showing that the physical signs of attractiveness are cues to health, fitness and fertility, and by wanting to have children with someone with those features, you're combining your genes with other genes that have the best chance of leading to offspring that will be healthy and fertile in their turn. Neuroscience has shown that there is a complex genetic patterning of the brain, another undermining of the blank slate. Uh, this is not an oil refinery, but a diagram of the 
uh, visual system of the primate brain comprising some 50 areas interconnected in specific ways. And recent research has started to show how uh, this cabling is laid out by complex patterns of gene expression. It's uh, present and pretty much functional in the newborn uh, monkey. And uh, recent research with knockout mice has shown that uh, the parcellation into cortical areas and their connections does not depend on sensory input or neural activity. Now, it's not just the basic cabling of the brain that's uh, under genetic control, but to some extent, the fine structure of the distribution of gray matter. Now, uh, the, um, I'm going to present now results from a recent study by Paul Thompson and his collaborators at UCLA, who used MRI to measure the amounts of gray matter in different parts of the brain in a large sample of individuals. And they looked at correlations between gray matter in uh, corresponding parts of the brain in two people, in pairs of people, and plotted them in false color so that uh, deep blue or purple uh, corresponds to no correlation and uh, other colors correspond to a statistically significant correlation. When you pair people at random, by definition you get zero correlation, and so here the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere, and a top view of the brain are depicted in uh, deep blue. This is what happens among people who share half their genes, namely fraternal twins. And as you can see, uh, a majority of the brain uh, has a distribution of gray matter that is significantly correlated across these uh, fraternal twins. This is what happens in people who share all of their genes, namely identical twins. And as you can see, even more uh, areas of the brain are correlated, uh, some of them at very uh, extremely high levels of statistical significance. Now, these, we have reason to believe that these uh, genetically influenced uh, features are not just meaningless bits of anatomy, like the shape of your outer ear, but have functional consequences. Uh, which I think are nicely summed up in the uh, following Charles Adams cartoon, also from The New Yorker. Separated at birth, the Malifert twins meet ac accidentally. <laughs> and you can see identical twins uh, <laughs> with identical contraptions in their lap sitting, who bump into each other in the waiting room of a patent attorney. Now, the cartoon is not that much of an exaggeration because studies of identical twins who were separated at birth and tested in adulthood show that they have uh, astonishing similarities. My favorite example being the pair of twins, one of whom was brought up as a Catholic in a Nazi family in Germany, the other was brought up in a Jewish family in Trinidad. Uh, when they were bumped into each other in the lab in their 40s, both were wearing identical navy blue shirts with epaulets. Both of them kept rubber bands around their wrists. Both of them like to dip buttered toast in coffee. Both of them flush the toilet before using it, as well as after. And both of them like to sneeze in crowded elevators to watch people jump. <laughs> now, you might think that these, are, th these have to be coincidences. Um, but in fact, these similarities are never observed in uh, fraternal twins who are test separated at birth and tested in adulthood. And they've been verified with more systematic measures using psychological um, instruments such as tests of personality and, and intelligence. Which leads to what's sometimes called the first law of behavioral genetics, which is that all behavioral traits are partially, though nowhere near completely, heritable. The noble savage has also uh, come under threat from uh, recent studies of, of the uh, mind. Behavioral genetics has shown that among the uh, heritable traits are having an antagonistic personality, a tendency to violate crime in certain circumstances, and psychopathy or the lack of a conscience. Neuroscience has shown that there are brain mechanisms associated with uh, aggression. And evolutionary psychology and anthropology have underscored the ubiquity of conflict in human societies. Now, here's a uh, graph from the archaeologist Lawrence Keeley which plots the percentage of male deaths due to warfare in a variety of, uh, of uh, societies. The red bars correspond to a number of pre-state societies, hunter-gatherer and hunter-horticultural societies in the Amazon rainforest and uh, New Guinea highlands. And they range from about a 10% uh, chance that a man will die at the hands of another man as opposed to dying of natural causes to almost a 60% chance that that's how a man will meet his end. 
the tiny little blue bar at the bottom of the graph plots the corresponding statistic for the United States and Europe in the 20th century, and it includes all of the casualties from two world wars. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to life in a state of nature, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. <laughs> now what about our culture? Has human nature changed in uh, Western democracies where we enjoy this comparatively low rate of violent death? Well, not necessarily. Here's a question, which I'd like you to just uh, think of and keep the answer to yourself. Please do not answer out loud. Have you ever thought about killing someone you don't like? Please keep the answer to yourself. <laughs> now, we psychologists are a nosy bunch, and several psychologists have asked samples of people, have you ever fantasized about killing someone that you don't like? And the uh, answer is that about uh, a third of men and 15% of women frequently think about killing people they don't like. <laughs> and uh, about three quarters of men and more than 60% of women at least occasionally fantasize about killing people they don't like. And I know what some of you are thinking, yeah, and the rest of them are lying. <laughs> but it's the ghost in the machine, I think, that has been uh, undergone the, the um, severest threat. Uh, cognitive science has shown that intelligence this seemingly miraculous process, which was formerly attributed uniquely to some spiritual uh, mental stuff, can be explained in mechanistic terms. By the, by the idea that beliefs uh, are a kind of information, that thinking is a form of information processing or computation, not computation like your Macintosh or PC does, but presumably some kind of parallel analog fuzzy computation, but computation nonetheless and that emotions can be thought of as mechanisms of feedback and control, a little bit like the principle that allows your thermostat to keep the temperature at a constant range. Um, artificial intelligence has confirmed that intelligent behavior can be carried out by uh, a, a mechanism, most famously in the defeat of the world chess champion Garry Kasparov by the computer known as Deep Blue. But it's been neuroscience that I think has most uh, thoroughly exercised the ghost in the machine through what Francis Crick has called the astonishing hypothesis, the hypothesis that all of our thoughts and feelings and, and passions and joys and aches consist of physiological activity in the tissues of the brain. And though the hypothesis is astonishing, there is increasing reason to believe that it's true. We know that a surgeon can, uh, by sending an electrical current through the cerebral cortex, can cause the person to have a, an experience that's indistinguishable from, uh, from a lifelike experience. We know that chemistry can affect consciousness, as when people take uh, drugs with psychological effects. When a surgeon uh, severs the corpus callosum and uh, disconnects the two cerebral hemispheres, the result can be two largely independent consciousnesses co-residing in one skull, as if the soul can be bisected with a knife. We know that damage to the brain can uh, eliminate a part of the person's mental life and can leave a uh, patient unable to appreciate music or to make a moral choice. Uh, so Descartes was wrong when he said that the mind is one and indivisible. We know that the brain has a staggering complexity 100 billion neurons interconnected by 100 trillion connections, which is fully commensurate with the com staggering complexity of human thought and behavior. Finally, we have every reason to believe that when the brain dies, the person goes out of existence. Despite uh, extensive efforts by 19th century scientists, no one has succeeded in communicating with the dead. Now, uh, this isn't a new idea, and I think the most eloquent uh, exposition of it comes from a remarkable passage from in the Brothers Karamazov in which the imprisoned Dmitri Karamazov has been visited by a local medical researcher and he's now recounting to his brother what he's just learned. And he says, imagine inside, in the nerves, in the head, there are sort of little tails. I look at something with my eyes and when they begin quivering, those little tails, an image appears. That is, an object or an action, damn it. That's why I see and then think, because of those tales, not because I've got a soul and that I am some sort of image and likeness. Rockyton explained it all to me yesterday, brother, and it simply bowled me over. It's magnificent, Alyosha, this science. A new man's arising, 
That I understand, and yet I am sorry to lose God. Now, many people are sorry to lose God when they hear of these results, or sorry to lose the values that are traditionally associated with uh, religion and God. And there's been a widespread fear and loathing of uh, a biological understanding of human nature, both from the left and from the right. Uh, from the academic left, for example, there, uh, the manifesto against sociobiology by Stephen Jay Gould, Richard Lewontin, and others uh, was posted after the biologist E.O. Wilson wrote his book, Sociobiology, which uh, was one of the first attempts to publicize the application of evolutionary biology to human behavior. And uh, here's what they wrote. The reason for the survival of these recurrent determinist theories is that they consistently tend to provide a genetic justification of the status quo and of existing privileges for certain groups according to class, race, or sex. These theories provided an important basis for the enactment of sterilization laws and also for the eugenics policies which led to the establishment of gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And as a result of these accusations, when Wilson would speak at college campuses for years later, he would be met with uh, demonstrators such as ones uh, called to his lecture by the, the following poster, come and hear Edward O. Wilson, sociobiologist and the prophet of right-wing patriarchy, and at the bottom of the poster it says, bring noisemakers. <laughs> but it's also been the uh, religious and cultural right that has been uh, offended by these uh, claims. In uh, the Weekly Standard, a popular conservative magazine uh, of uh, political opinion, which I'm willing to bet not a single person in this room reads, um, Andrew Ferguson wrote the following, biological theories of the mind are sure to give you the creeps because whether a behavior is moral, whether it signifies virtue is a judgment that the new science and materialism in general cannot make. He contrasted it with the Judeo-Christian view according to which human beings are persons from the start endowed with a soul created by God and infinitely precious. And this is the common understanding the new science means to undo. Now this was a, an articulate statement of this fear, and not all the statements have been that articulate. Um, here's one from Tom DeLay, the House uh, Republican Majority Whip, who offered the following theory of the cause of the Columbine High School shootings of four years ago. He said that these outbursts are inevitable because our school systems teach children that they are nothing but glorified apes evolutionized out of some primordial soup of mud. And the uh, House Judiciary Committee uh, received the following testimony from a creationist think tank about the dangers of Darwinism. They cited the lyrics of a rock song, you and me baby ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. Well, these are ser serious accusations and uh, and I think that they really should be, should be addressed. And that's what I try to do in the, the bulk of the blank slate. I think that the, the fears of human nature can be boiled down to four concerns, the fear of inequality, the fear of imperfectibility, the fear of determinism, and the fear of nihilism, uh, which I'll discuss separately. I'm going to argue that all of them are based on non sequiturs. They come about because these ideas are so unfamiliar, not because uh, the conclusions actually follow from the discoveries. And I'm going to go further and say that not only are there not the dangers that so many people have feared in a uh, better understanding of human nature, but there are actually dangers in denying human nature that have been less appreciated. And because of this, we should look at human nature objectively without putting a moral thumb on either side of the scale. So let me start with a fear of uh, inequality. It comes from a basic mathematical uh, truth, which is that zero equals zero. If we're blank slates, we must be equal. But if the mind has any innate organization, then different races, sexes, classes, or individuals could be biologically different, and that would condone discrimination and oppression. Well, I think as soon as you see the argument laid out this way, you can, you can see that, that um, it really doesn't, uh, doesn't follow. That um, it confuses the notion of fairness with the notion of sameness, and they're not the same thing. <clears throat> when the Declaration of Independence uh, declared, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, uh, Thomas Jefferson was not saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are clones. <laughs> Rather, our commitment to political equality is 
foremost, a uh, commitment to recognizing certain universal human interests that arise because humans have a uh, universal nature and suffer and prosper uh, because of the same conditions. As the Declaration continues, people are endowed with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Also, it's a commitment to prohibit discrimination against individuals based on the statistics of certain groups, such as race, ethnicity, sex, or class, uh, that they belong to. And neither of these believes declaring a priori that all human groups, however, uh, or individuals, are biologically indistinguishable. Also, there's a downside of denying uh, 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 human differences. And that is that if you believe that people are indistinguishable, but you observe that some of them end up better than others, there's a temptation to uh, assume that they must be more greedy or avaricious. And indeed, many of the outbreaks of uh, violence against ethnic minorities in the 20th century came uh, in from uh, ethnic groups that had cultural practices and set out social conditions that allowed their more talented members to prosper. And because of these visible individuals, uh, the groups as a whole were often subject to uh, expulsion or, and persecution and pogroms. The most obvious example is the um, case of the Jews in uh, Europe, but other examples include the Chinese in Malaysia and Indonesia, the Indians in East Africa and the South Pacific, and the Igbos in Nigeria. Now the second fear is the fear of imperfectibility, the dashing of the age-old dream of the perfectibility of humankind. And it runs as, more or less as follows. Uh, if ignoble traits are innate, such as selfishness, violence, prejudice, and rape, that would make them unchangeable, so attempts at social reform and human improvement would be a waste of time. Why try to make the world a better place if people are rotten to the core and will just foul it up no matter what you do? That's the nature of the fear. Well, I think that too is uh, a non sequitur because ignoble motives do not automatically lead to ignoble behavior. The human mind is undoubtedly a complex system with many parts, and some of these parts can counteract others, such as uh, a moral sense, a set of cognitive abilities that allows us to learn the lessons of history, and executive systems of the frontal lobes that can convert these uh, moral goals and knowledge of uh, history into tangible behavior. In fact, the social progress that we undoubtedly have enjoyed over the past few centuries and that can be continued didn't come from denying human nature or erasing it and starting out with something completely different, but rather by taking one part of human nature and expanding its range of application. The philosopher Peter Singer, in his book, The Expanding Circle, argued that universally you see humans demonstrate a capacity for empathy, an ability to sympathize with other people. Unfortunately, the default setting for that sense of uh, empathy is one's own uh, clan or village or tribe. Uh, and people outside that circle have traditionally been treated as uh, subhuman. But what we've seen over the past few centuries is an expansion of that circle so that it embraces not just uh, the tribe, but other tribes, uh, other races, uh, prisoners, children, uh, the handicapped, the uh, mentally impaired, and most recently, in the case of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all of humanity. And so this progress, uh, ongoing progress, doesn't have to uh, consist of uh, pretending that human nature doesn't exist, but rather taking one feature of human nature and adjusting a, a knob or slider that controls the size of the circle that embraces the entities whose interests we treat as equivalent to our own. Um, and uh, there's also a, uh, downsides in a belief in perfectibility. It's really not as rosy as it might appear anyway. And I'll discuss three of them. The first is the uh, invitation to intrusive social engineering. If people are blank slates, then the temptation of leaders is to say that we, we damn well better fill up, uh, control what gets uh, written on those sl uh, slates rather than leaving it to chance. This is an argument that uh, some of you are familiar with from our colleague uh, Noam Chomsky in the Department of Linguistics. 
And in fact, uh, many of the totalitarian uh, dictatorships of the 20th century were quite explicitly based on the doctrine of the blank slate. For example, Mao Zedong, probably responsible for 35 million deaths, wrote, it is on a blank page that the most beautiful poems are written. Similarly, the Khmer Rouge, who massacred a quarter of their countrymen, had a slogan, only the newborn baby is spotless. And less horrifically, but still significant, we hear the, an echo of the blank slate in a quote from the uh, planner and architect Le Corbusier, that city, city planners should begin with a clean tablecloth. We must build places where mankind will be reborn. And here's what Le, Le Corbusier had in mind uh, in terms of uh, starting with a clean tablecloth. This is a, a picture of Paris, or at least it's a picture of what Paris would have looked like if Le Corbusier had been granted his wish to begin with a clean tablecloth. Um, why would Le Corbusier want to make Paris look like this? Well, he was an architect of uh, a movement sometimes called authoritarian high modernism. The idea that society should be planned from the top down uh, according to, quote, scientific uh, principles based on a notion of human needs. Now, the problem was that they had a blank slate theory of human needs that every human, according to the scientific calculation, needed so many gallons of water per day for bathing, so many gallons of water for drinking, so many cubic feet of air to breathe, so many square feet in which to sleep, ways to commute to work, and that was pretty much uh, it. And so the most efficient way to satisfy those needs would be to crowd people into concrete uh, high-rises uh, linked by uh, superhighways. Now, we now, I think, realize what went wrong with this vision that uh, they left out the rest of human nature, needs such as uh, the need for intimate social interaction in uh, public places in which people could meet, the need for green space, what E.O. Wilson called biophilia, the uh, well-being that people feel when surrounded by nature, the effect of natural light on mood, visual aesthetics and ornamentation, the need for human scale, places in which people could feel safe and cozy, and uh, by forgetting these needs, even though Le Corbusier didn't uh, achieve his dream of flattening Paris and starting all over, his um, disciples did uh, get carte blanche to design Brasilia, uh, which is notorious as one of the most uninviting urban wastelands anywhere. And this theory was responsible for the so-called urban renewal projects of the late 1950s and 1960s in which vibrant urban neighborhoods were bulldozed and replaced by concrete high-rises, uh, freeways, and uh, empty open plazas. Now, a related downside of the belief in perfectibility is a lack of appreciation for democracy. Another feature of uh, 20th century totalitarian dictatorships is that they were uh, brought in in revolutions by charismatic, idealistic leaders who based their claim to authority on moral superiority to their predecessors and their rivals, who believed that their repressive measures were just uh, temporary and would vanish as the state withered away, leaving people to uh, coexist in a kind of romantic, utopian state of anarchy. And I think it was this, these seemingly uh, benevolent principles that led to many uh, authoritarian dictatorships and indeed genocides. In contrast, uh, democracy, which I think has had a uh, more benign outcome, is based on a rather jaundiced theory of human nature, according to which people are eternally um, subjected to uh, ambition and self-deception and delusions of moral superiority. Uh, the, the best statement of that comes from James Madison, who wrote, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. And it's this uh, pessimistic theory of human nature that led to democracies with their permanent checks and balances, mechanisms that were explicitly designed to counteract the uh, innate tendencies of humans towards ambition and self-deception. Finally, uh, a third downside of the belief in perfectibility, I think, is a distortion of human relationships, especially parenting. Now, here's a quote in an article on um, the parenting experts 
uh, that appeared in the Boston Globe a couple of years ago. And it quotes a frazzled mother who uh, told the reporter, I'm overwhelmed with parenting advice. I'm supposed to do lots of physical activity with my kids so I can instill in them a physical fitness habit so they'll grow up to be healthy adults. And I'm supposed to do all kinds of intellectual play so they'll grow up smart. And there are all kinds of play, clay for finger dexterity, word games for reading success, large motor play, small motor play. I feel like I could devote my life to figuring out what to play with my kids. On top of that, I have to be a short order cook, preparing two or three meals at a time, because if I force my kids to choose between eating what's there or skipping a meal, they'll get an eating disorder. Uh, pressures on uh, mothers that I think our mothers did not have to face, uh, and that have led to much of the anxiety that, uh, that women feel today. Now, here's some sobering facts about parenting. Most of the studies of parenting that, uh, that led to this advice are useless. They're useless because they don't control for heritability. They show that parents who talk a lot to their children have uh, advanced language skills, that parents who spank their children have kids who grow up to be violent, that parents who talk to their teenagers have kids who are less likely to be on drugs. Uh, but what they don't even consider as an alternative hypothesis is that parents give genes to their children as well as a family environment and the correlations, which as we all know, don't necessarily imply causation, could merely be saying that talkative people have talkative kids and violent people have violent kids and so on. When studies are done with the proper genetic controls, that is, using twins or adoptees, the results are rather bracing. They uh, show that uh, siblings separated at birth end up as similar as siblings reared together. Now, remember the Malifert twins separated at birth, reunited in adulthood, and both of them ended up with uh, identical contraptions on their laps at the, in the uh, waiting office at the patent attorney. Now, think about what would have happened if the Malifert twins had not been separated at birth and they grew up together. Well, <clears throat> then you might think they share all their genes and they share all their environment, so they must be even more similar. Well, in fact, they're not. Siblings separated at birth are no more different than siblings reared together. And complementing this finding is that adoptive siblings, this is the mirror image of identical twins separated at birth. The separated twins share their genes, don't share their environment. Adoptive siblings share their environment, don't share their genes, and they end up not similar at all. Uh, they are no more similar when tested as adults than two people plucked from the population at random. So what the study suggests is that children are not shaped by parents, but are shaped in part, though only in part, by genes, in large part by culture, both the surrounding culture of the society and the subculture that they grow up in, and also the culture of children themselves, which we condescendingly call their peer group, uh, and in large part by chance, factors that, uh, that no one really can predict in the uh, wiring of the brain in utero and chance events as we live our lives. Now, when many people hear their findings, their first reaction is, oh, so you're saying it doesn't matter how I treat my children? Well, what a question. Of course it matters how you treat your children. Uh, it's never all right to uh, abuse or beat or belittle or neglect a child because those are horrible things for a big, strong person to do to a helpless little person uh, who is their responsibility. Child rearing, above all, is an ethical responsibility. Also, another uh, simple truth that people are apt to forget is that, um, let's say I, I told you that you don't have the power to shape the personality of your spouse. Now, no one but a newlywed thinks that they can change the personality of their spouse. <laughs> Nonetheless, when you hear this, your reaction isn't, oh, so you're saying it doesn't matter how I treat my spouse? Well, of course it matters how you treat your spouse because you, you're nice to your spouse so that you'll build a deep and satisfying and loving relationship. And that's a good reason to be nice to your kids, to have a, a deep and lasting and uh, reciprocal relationship of respect and love with your children. Uh, and I think it's a sign of the um, somewhat pernicious effect of the blank slate that these basic human truths can be uh, forgotten and that people can think of parenting only as the molding or manipulation of children's personalities. And so when they're told that they can't manipulate ch their children's personalities, they think it doesn't matter how they treat them at all, forgetting that child rearing 
that uh, parents and children have a human relationship. Um, I'll go through the, the um, last two fears a, a little bit more uh, quickly. Uh, the fear of determinism is the fear of the opposite of free will and responsibility in the, uh, in the philosopher's sense. And the fear is that if behavior is caused by a person's biology, he can't be held responsible for it. And it's not just a hypothetical fear. Here's a headline from the Wall Street Journal of a few years ago. Man's genes made him kill his lawyer's claim. And you can insert your favorite lawyer joke here. Now, uh, this defense did not succeed. The, uh, the man's genes did not get him off the hook. Um, and I think it's, uh, when you think about it, it's clear why not. There's an old saying, to understand is not to forgive. Standards of responsibility, that is holding people uh, responsible for their behavior, uh, is itself a cause of behavior. Uh, these standards don't have to appeal to a ghost or some mysterious entity that we call free will, but rather to certain parts of the brain, presumably concentrated in the prefrontal cortex, that can anticipate the consequences of behavior, whether it will be esteemed or condemned, rewarded or punished, and can inhibit behavior accordingly. We can continue to hold people responsible, that is, retain this influence on the brain systems for inhibition, even as we come to understand the brain systems for temptation. Now, um, there's also, I think, a downside in, uh, in believing that, that uh, genes are the only thing that erode responsibility. And that is that, in fact, most of the bogus defenses for bad behavior that creative defense lawyers have come up with are more likely to be environmental than biological to begin with. Examples include the abuse excuse, which uh, was used to get the Menendez brothers off the hook in their first trial. They claimed that the reason that they shot their parents to death is because they were abused by the parents uh, years ago as children. The black rage syndrome, which the radical lawyer William Kunstler proposed to defend the Long Island Railroad gunman, saying that he snapped un under the pressure of living in a racist society. The patriarchy made me do it defense, which uh, lawyers have used to try to exonerate rapists, saying they were inflamed by uh, pornographic images and a misogynistic society. And uh, probably the best statement uh, of this uh, syndrome comes from West Side Story, and I'm sure you all remember the scene in which the juvenile delinquents say to the local police sergeant, Dear kindly Sergeant Krupke, you got to understand, it's just our bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mothers all are junkies. Our fathers all are drunks. Golly, Moses, naturally, we're punks. <laughs> Finally, there's the fear of, of nihilism, uh, which runs as follows, that biology strips life of meaning and purpose. It says that love, beauty, and morality are just figments of a brain pursuing selfish evolutionary strategies. Uh, and I'll give you an, an illustration of this fear from the uh, comic page of the Boston Globe, from the uh, comic strip Arlo and Janice, in which one night our hero Arlo can't sleep. He's racked by existential doubt, pacing the floors, uh, unable to fall asleep. Asks his son, why am I here? And the boy says, to pass on your genes. You still here? Now, admittedly, most people find this an unsatisfying answer to the question. Now, uh, the fear of nihilism, uh, many people think of as a religious uh, concern, but in fact there are religious and secular versions of the fear which I'll consider separately. The religious version is that people need to believe in a soul which seeks to fulfill God's purpose and is rewarded or punished in an afterlife, and that without the belief in a soul, then morality has no basis and all hell would break loose. Well, I, one response to the religious fear is that um, a belief in a life to come is not necessarily such a good thing because it necessarily devalues life on Earth. At a, in our, at a personal level, Think about what you say to yourself when you use the cliche, life is short. That is a, an impetus to bury the hatchet in a pointless dispute, to offer a gesture of affection uh, to a loved one, to vow to use your time productively and not to squander it. I think one could argue that nothing gives life more meaning than the realization that every moment of consciousness is a precious gift. Also. Have you ever noticed that in practice, God's purpose is always conveyed by other human beings? 
Well, I think this opens the door to a certain amount of mischief. Um, now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the satirical newspaper, The Onion. Well, you may, might remember a year ago, the uh, famous headline, hijackers surprised to find selves in hell. <laughs> we expected eternal paradise for this, say suicide bombers. Well, this was criticized at the time for being rather tasteless, uh, and it is rather tasteless. But I think it, it uh, makes a, uh, a valid point, uh, which is that even if you thought that people, that there are some people who could not be deterred by the standards of their community, the uh, police and government, uh, or their own conscience, and could only be deterred from committing evil acts by the, the threat of spending eternity in hell, there are also people, undoubtedly, who commit atrocious acts by the promise of spending eternity in heaven. Um, now, what about the secular version uh, of, the, uh, of the fear of nihilism? Well, I think the response to this is best summed up in the opening scene of Annie Hall, in which the six-year-old Woody Allen has been taken to the family doctor by his mother. The doctor says, why are you depressed, Alvy? His mother answers for him. It's something he read. Something he read, huh? And Alvy says, the universe is expanding. The universe is expanding? Well, the universe is everything, and if it's expanding, someday it will break apart, and that would be the end of everything. His mother says, what is that your business? He stopped doing his homework. And <laughs> Alvy says, what's the point? <laughs> well, how do we answer this? As often happens in life, the best answer uh, came from Alvy's mother, uh, as wisdom often comes from mothers, uh, when she said, what has the universe got to do with it? You're here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. <laughs> Uh, indeed, we laugh because uh, Alvi has confused two different levels of analysis, and I think the secular version of the fear of nihilism also confuses two different levels of analysis. The human level, uh, which operates on the time scale of years and decades, namely, what is meaningful to us and how we want to live our, live our lives today, given the brains that we have, as opposed to the causal level, acting over hundreds of thousands or millions of years, which is how and why our brain causes us to have those thoughts. Another way of putting it is, just because genes are in some metaphorical sense selfish, it doesn't mean that we are selfish. And just because the process of evolution is purposeless and amoral, it doesn't mean that the end product of that, prop uh, of that process has to be selfish and amoral. There's nothing that prevents the process of evolution from resulting in the evolution of a big brain social species with an elaborate moral sense. Uh, there's a cliche that people who appreciate legislation and sausages should not see them being made. The same, the same might be true of human uh, moral sentiments. Um, and in fact, the, the final thought that I will um, present is that once we have a moral sense, it's not necessarily the case that its intuitions are figments or hallucinations. But there is a sense in which morality has an inherent logic that the human moral sense can be thought to implement. And again, I'll uh, turn to the comic pages to illustrate this idea, although it's an idea that goes back to at least to Plato. Um, you remember the, uh, the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. Well, one day, Calvin inadvertently demonstrates why we can't do without morality by claiming that he is going to do without it. He says one day, I don't believe in ethics anymore. As far as I'm concerned, the ends justify the means. Get what you can while the getting's good, that's what I say. Might makes right, the winners write the history books. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, so I'll do whatever I have to and let others argue about whether it's right or not. Hey, why'd you do that? And Hobbes answers, you were in my way, now you're not, the ends justify the means. And Calvin says, I didn't mean for everyone you dolt, just me. <laughs> Aha. Uh, indeed, the uh, philosophy of just me immediately dissolves uh, when one has to, as soon as one has to persuade other people of rules to live by, it's logically inconsistent to demand that other people abide by rules that one is not willing to abide by oneself, simply because you can't convince someone else that you occupy a pr privileged position in the universe. This, I think, is the logical basis of morality, and it's why different versions, such as the golden rule and the categorical imperative, have been rediscovered by the world's secular and religious moral traditions. 
So let me sum up. Um, I've argued that the dominant theory of human nature in modern intellectual life comprises the doctrines of the blank slate, the noble savage, and the ghost in the machine. That these doctrines are being challenged by the modern sciences of mind, brain, genes, and evolution. That these challenges are also seen to threaten fundamental moral values, but in fact, uh, that doesn't follow. On the contrary, I think a better understanding of what makes people tick can clarify those values by showing that political equality does not require sameness, but policies that treat people as individuals with rights. That moral progress does not require that the mind is free of selfish motives, only that it has other motives to counteract them. Responsibility does not require that behavior is uncaused, only that it responds to contingencies of credit and blame. And meaning in life does not require that the process that shaped the brain have a purpose, only that the brain itself have a purpose. Moreover, I think that grounding values in a blank slate is a mistake. It's a mistake because it makes important values hostages to fortune, implying that someday empirical discoveries could make them obsolete. And it's a mistake because it conceals the downsides of denying human nature, such as persecution of the successful, totalitarian social engineering, an exaggeration of the effects of the environment, such as in parenting and the criminal justice system, a mystification of the uh, bases of responsibility, democracy, and morality, and the devaluing of human life on Earth. Thank you very much. And uh, are there any questions? There are two microphones in the aisles, and uh, it would be a good idea to come up to the microphone so that other people can hear the question. Yes, Phil. Um, well, thank you very much, Professor Pinker. Uh, this was as fun as the 2,900 lectures that I sat through. <laughs> all just as invigorating. In this very room. Um, one of the aspects which you talked about was the implications for free will having to do with this discussion. Um, and what I wanted to ask you is that there seem to be notions of desert and retribution. Um, retribution especially, which the Supreme Court said was the main tenet of our justice system, which seemed to be very involved with notions of free will. So taking into account free will and how it plays into certain retribution, using the argument where you don't have a notion of a soul and just sort of being mechanical, um, is there a relevant distinction to be made between the desert that a human being has as opposed to the desert that a computer deserves when it does something well? And do you think that these are important things to take into consideration? Uh, yeah, I think, I think they are. And I have a, I have a chapter on that, uh, that very question. Um, based in, in, in part on uh, work of Dan Dennett in his book, Elbow Room, uh, which he's going to expand in a forthcoming book called, uh, I think, Freedom Evolves. Um, and the argument is that in, uh, you know, I don't claim in, uh, to have solved the problem of free will. The, but the, my argument is you don't need to have solved the, the problem of, of free will. You just have to ask why we want free will. What kind of free will um, do we really care about? That's why the subtitle of Dennett's uh, Elbow Room was The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. The reason we want free will is not that we think it's important that people can do whatever they want, whenever they want. That would actually be a bad thing, not a good thing. Be and an example from Dennett is Every time you drive along the road, you are counting on the following deterministic uh, belief in human behavior, that the drivers on the other side of the road are not going to immediately swerve into your lane, killing both of you, because they have the free will to do, to do that. You really want, in some cases, human behavior to be 100% predictable. What you want free will for is that among the things that make uh, behavior predictable are anticipation of consequences, of blame and credit, of reward and punishment. So by holding someone responsible, saying, if you do the following act, we will think you're a boorish cat and ostracize you, or we'll put you in jail, or we'll fine you, that will have a predictable, indeed a deterministic effect on behavior. Namely, cattish, boorish behavior will decrease in frequency if it has consequences. If people really had free will, they could 
uh, I mean, free will in the sense of doing whatever you want whenever you want, they could say, well, I don't care what you think about me, and I don't care if I spend the rest of my life in jail. I'm going to murder or rape or steal or assault, uh, nonetheless, because I have the freedom to do so. So the kind of free will we want is really not complete unpredictability, but almost the opposite. We want behavior to respond to certain contingencies, such as the ones that we try to implement in the criminal justice system. And indeed, a lot of the exceptions that we make in the criminal justice system, like the insanity defense or excluding children from uh, criminal uh, penalties, I think are really grounded on the idea that a, the principle of um, trying to deter bad behavior without causing unnecessary suffering, that is pure spite, pure punitiveness for its own sake, should discriminate among people for whom criminal sanctions will be an effective deterrent, namely people of sound mind, and people where punishing them will not deter similar people like them in the future, such as children and the, the truly insane. Um, and so that's, I think, the kind of analysis of what you want free will to do that I think gets us out of this conundrum. Thank you. Right. Yes. Um, in that we're all relieved that nobody brought noisemakers tonight, <laughs> um, my question is, oh, what's your sense of the percent of uh, social scientists in the academic community in the U.S. that still subscribe wholeheartedly to the blank slate or its equivalents? And a sort of quick follow-up to that would be, and are you going to continue your mission here to help uh, move people away from that? Well, I, I guess I would know percentages, and, and you know, social science is a Scientist is a big category, and I, I consider myself a, a kind of social scientist in, insofar as psychology is commonly yeah. thought to be a social scientist. Science, um, I, I wouldn't know percentages because there are social sciences fractionated into different schools. There are sort of quantitative number that crunching. Sense, right? um, I think that it's. Uh, I, I probably would, shouldn't say, uh, offer a percentage. I think there are schools of social science. I think probably a very large percentage of cultural anthropologists would subscribe to the blank slate, um, a, a smaller number of psychologists and, and uh, sociologists. But they, I think they're too fractionated to generalize across the whole discipline. So we aren't really, um, you don't think that we're sort of under that uh, misconception as, as we proceed in, in the social sciences today? Well, I think there's some, there's some schools. So for example, postmodernism in the humanities yeah. uh, certainly believes in a kind of blank slate psychology in that reality is socially constructed as opposed to being a, a product of human faculty of cognition and perception. Okay. Um, and it's often assumed in um, postmodernist anthropology and um, a literary criticism that, uh, that there's no enduring human nature. Uh, certainly among in Marxist sociology and Marxist economics, uh, there's also a, a um, fervent belief that it's meaningless to talk about an enduring human nature. Um, so I think it would, you'd have to subdivide it into different schools yeah. of thought. Yeah. You, did, you did get a pretty critical review in the uh, New York Times book review from a fellow there. That from a, a historian. Kind of confirmed the, the, the antagonism that's still out there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so just a uh, simple question. Uh, the quote by Madison, didn't that show more of an understanding of human nature in designing a government rather than uh, some type of overdoing social engineering? And, oh. if not, and if not, what suggestions would you make to improve a Republican government or what alternative to a Republican government would you suggest? Oh, no, I didn't make myself clear. I, I cited Madison as an acknowledgment of human nature and as a good thing, not as social engineering and a bad thing. So, so Madison, I would, I'm claiming Madison on my side. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's so, great. So I, did, I didn't make I, that. I feel much better now. Okay, I'm sorry for not making that clear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, a friend of mine has a son who was described at a very young age as, by, a cl by a clinical psychologist as utterly lacking in empathy. And you use the term tonight. Um, where does, is there such a thing? Um, is it? If there is, is it possible to be utterly lacking in it? And where, how would we describe it in terms of the brain? Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is a, a syndrome, sometimes uh, alternatively called antisocial personality disorder, sociopathy, uh, or psychopathy, which, um, which does seem to be, I mean, to a first approximation, be uh, a lack of empathy. Um, and these are uh, people estimated at somewhere would say about three to five, three percent of the male population um, that in, engages in things like um, 
raping a succession of women, uh, bilking elderly people out of their life savings, uh, shooting convenience store clerks lying on the floor during a robbery. Uh, and often signs of psychopathy can show up early uh, in children who um, beat up kids much smaller than themselves, torture animals, don't seem to respond to entreaties by their parents to, uh, you know, how would you feel if, or think about the way it makes someone else feel. Um, I don't think anyone knows the, the causes. There's some evidence that, it's like, like everything, it's partly heritable, but nowhere near completely heritable. Um, it's probably um, uh, tied to uh, activity in the frontal lobes, uh, possibly also the amygdala, uh, one of a uh, brain structure tightly connected to the frontal lobes that seems to process the emotional valence of, of uh, stimuli. Um, so not completely understood, but the clinical syndrome is, um, uh, has been repeatedly documented. Probably Ted Bundy would be the uh, prototype case, often superficially charming and socially skilled, but utterly lacking in any sense of remorse or empathy. Thank you. Yes? In light of the way in which our technology is now helping us manipulate our appearances, to what extent will this push genetic selection to select for behaviors more than for uh, physical traits. Yeah. You, you mean by genetic engineering? No, not by genetic engineering, but just if you can go out and have plastic surgery, then that's going to change your appearance. So people are not so much making the, quote, right decision for selecting for this favorable gene. They're actually selecting for an un, a disfavored oh. gene. I, I think that um, the... Uh, it's, it's really impossible to tell what effect on biological evolution our current cultural practices uh, will lead to, simply because biological evolution requires that certain kinds of selection contingencies be in place over a long enough period of time and over some kind of cohesive group of organisms in order to have its effect. So one could always speculate what would the human species be like if the current practices now extended over 100,000 years and applied to a, one culture that was hermetically sealed from other cultures. But given that we lurch from lifestyle to lifestyle pretty quickly, no one can predict how we'll be living in 100 years. And there's no part of the human planet in which you have a self-contained um, you know, set of breeding isolates, but you have constant immigration and emigration. We're a moving target for biological evolution. And um, it's possible that we're not evolving in any particular direction. We know in other cases of evolution that species don't change, sometimes over millions of years. And although no one can, you'd have to sort of go into a time machine in the future to answer the question, I think there's reason to believe that there's no consistent change in human evolution that we can spot right now. Okay, At least evolution in the biological sense. Yes? Um, I'm sure that your uh, statement or finding that children are not shaped by parents as much as they are by genes, culture, and the chance uh, surprise many. Um, and, but I would like to know what study or studies did you use to support that statement? Mm -hmm. And also um, what or how it was measured and where they were conducted? Yes. There's a, by now a large number of studies from behavior geneticists most people hear about these studies because they um, remember the findings that, that there is some statistical genetic influence on, on behavior, such as the fact that twins separated at birth uh, are, uh, are highly similar. But those same studies try to see whether growing up in a given home has a lasting effect. And often to the shock of the researchers themselves, who are sure, since Let's say the effect of the genes is uh, 40 to 50 percent of the variation in a particular sample. What everyone expected would be that the other 50 to 60 percent would come from the home, from growing up in the same home. So that, say, adopted siblings growing up in the same home should be much more similar than randomly selected pairs of people. And in study after study, uh, done in numerous countries, United States, Scandinavia, um, uh, Western Europe, Time and again, the results came up to be 0 to 10 percent of the variation being attributed to uh, a given family. So the, there are two sets of studies that uh, use different techniques but have the same conclusion, namely, sibs separated at birth are no more um, 
sorry, no less similar that SIBs brought up together and adopted siblings are not similar at all. Corroborating that, there are a number of studies of, um, that look at parenting in other ways that I think also uh, are consistent with this finding. And, and the, the person who really deserves credit for summing it up is Judith Rich Harris in her book, The Nurture Assumption. She also points out that studies that compare different kids growing up in very different circumstances, only children versus children with siblings, kids who uh, spend a lot of time in daycare versus those with stay-at-home moms, kids with two lesbian mothers versus one of each sex, uh, kids who grow up in a hippie commune as opposed to a kind of leave it to beaver home. Uh, in all of those cases, the effects are pretty close to zero. Um, so that's a whole set of corroborations of what the behavioral geneticists tell us about the long-term effects of parenting. Then on top of that, if you, here's some, just sort of a common sense observation that I think is very robust. If you look at immigration, you look at cases where kids grow up in one culture and their parents come from another culture. How do, what, how do the kids end up? Take accent uh, as, the, uh, as a salient example. The answer is in virtually every case, kids grow up with the accent of their peers not the accent of their parents, and not even something that's halfway in between the accent of their peers and their parents. Likewise with styles of dress, tastes in music, and so on. So the upshot of these studies is not by no means that genes are everything, because they show conclusively that genes generally don't account for more than half of the variance. That's a lot more than zero. It's a lot less than 100%. What it suggests is that culture matters, uh, that is not the individual parents, but the surrounding peer culture, and, to, uh, and probably also that chance matters. Excuse me, just uh, an yeah. addition here is that it seems to me that, I, I mean, that's why I ask what was actually measured, because if you measure a in behavioral way, like how they walk, how they dress, et cetera, et cetera, then definitely, I mean, parents do not have to have a certain strong role in that. However, if you measure value system that is actually underneath our skin, some, I mean, it's somewhere in there. It's not really that visible. And it's not as easy to measure it. Yeah. And, uh, and it kind of operates our behavior kind of down the line. Yeah. Um, then th this is kind of where I'm a little bit just, you know, curious whether they were measuring just, you know, how they dress, how they talk, what they do in an elevator, as you yes. said, or, <laughs> right. or um, you know, or they actually measured a value system to... to well, here are some things, here are some of the things they, they um, did measure that are at least indirectly relevant to the value system. One of it is, um, what they do most often is give tests of personality, and these are batteries that, that you may have, many of you may have filled out where you uh, do a checklist of 550 statements that are then, uh, the numbers are then crunched, and they indicate um, you know, more or less reliably how conscientious someone is, that is whether they attend to, or they're responsible and attend to details, or whether they're more sloppy and irresponsible. Uh, how um, agreeable versus antagonistic they are, that is, do they basically sort of like people, uh, or are they basically hostile to other people? Uh, whether they're neurotic or self-confident, introverted, extroverted. So these are some of the things that are um, where you can't measure an effect of uh, the, the home and family. Also, there's some concrete cut and dried behavioral statistics that, that fall under this generalization. Likelihood of getting divorced, um, likelihood of getting into trouble with the law, which um, is, uh, again, not um, shows an environmental effect of neighborhood sometimes, but not one of, uh, typically one of parents. Um, number of cigarettes smoked, uh, number of hours of television watched. The generalization is just about anything you measure uh, shows uh, an effect of genes that's greater than zero, less than 100%, an effect of parenting that is small, zero to 10%, an effect of something else, presumably culture and chance, that is about 50% of the variation. Thank you. Yes. To what degree do you think that um, art or aesthetic judgments might be constrained or shaped by biological human nature? Or maybe phrased another way, what I, potential or relevance do you think that um, cognitive science has in discussions of the humanities about aesthetic value or quality? 
Yeah, um, it, it's an interesting question. I have a, uh, a chapter on that kind of topic. Um, I think there is an, an influence that's often underestimated in the contemporary um, uh, world of criticism, that there are um, patterns, universal patterns in music. There are universal visual uh, motifs such as symmetry and repetition. There are universal patterns in what makes a face attractive and what, what makes a landscape attractive. Poetry uh, has a common structure of three second lines followed by pauses. Um, so in part it's a, a question of whether the glass is half empty or half full. There's undoubtedly variation in aesthetic tastes from culture to culture and from decade to decade. But there's also, I think, some degree of, uh, of commonality. And I, I cite some of the sources of universal uh, aesthetics in that chapter. Yes? It's common be commonly believed that um, child abuse can cause personality disorders, and it seems to be the basis of psychotherapy um, that people should look into their childhood to discover how to fix their current um, lives. And I'm wondering if that's a caveat to your heritability argument. Um, and if you want to take the genetics out of it, you can point to cases of step parents abusing children um, and resulting in profound personality disorders. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Certainly cases of, of uh, criminal abuse, I think we have reason to believe, can, can leave um, scars in the form of uh, basically the equivalent of post-traumatic stress disorder, which I think children can suffer from as much as adults. Um, but um, it's not clear that, in general, um, say, uh, how parents treat their children in the first few years of life leaves a lasting mark on their personality. And other than, uh, than I think, the extremes of neglect and abuse, growing up in a Romanian orphanage, deprived of all human contact, or being uh, beaten by a parent and being traumatized that way, other than that, it's not clear that uh, current life difficulties can be traced back to parental maltreatment, even though that is a, or at least it was, a common assumption in psychotherapy, especially uh, psychoanalytic or psychodynamic psychotherapy. Um, I think there's, there's not a whole lot of evidence for that. And more and more I think contemporary psychotherapists are moving away from finding the root of the adult difficulties in parental treatment and simply um, saying to people, well, that was then, this is now, let's look at how you can um, uh, cope with the current challenges based on the talents and temperaments you now have. Uh, but it is a, a key question. Thank you. Yes. yes. Uh, do you think that there are innate and significant mental or psychological uh, differences between racial groups? Um, I don't think there's any, uh, well, I don't think there's any evidence that the differences between racial groups uh, have a genetic basis. And the reason is that um, the current differences in ethnic groups and races in measures like uh, IQ can always be matched to um, historic differences between ethnic groups that have now disappeared. So that the, say the, the um, gap between uh, African American and European Americans in IQ scores today is similar to the gap between immigrants from Western Europe and Eastern Europe in the 1920s, but that uh, difference uh, vanished. Um, and similarly, the, um, even within a, um, a particular uh, ethnic or racial group, we know that IQ scores have risen over, recent, uh, over the past uh, 70 or 80 years, about three IQ points a decade. Uh, no one knows why, and it's certainly not a genetic difference because we, evolution doesn't uh, operate that quickly. Um, and so, um, since we know that, there, that a 15-point IQ gap can um, simply exist between, say, European Americans today and European Americans in 1950, there's no reason to believe that the difference between different ethnic groups or races couldn't have a, an environmental explanation of a similar magnitude. Yes? Uh, I'm not quite sure what my question is, but I, um, uh, I'll try to maybe ask, ask a question anyway. In listening to you, I have the sense that somehow um, a quality or an aspect of intersubjectivity is missing, and I, I wish I could hear more of that, or did I miss, or did I not hear something that you said? But for example, in the, the example of the pilots, um, that it's not an intellectual reasoning, you know, to, to fear that 
one might uh, for an eternity be in hell if one doesn't do something. But it's, it's sometimes a permeability of a mind to other minds or a permeability between minds where um, a hatred or a, a joy or, or uh, a quality of mind penetrates another mind and there's the barriers are, are loosened. And um, it seems that somehow in talking about human nature, that quality of intersubjectivity, um, it needs to be um, included. And I wondered if there was some relationship between that and the, the, the issue of an uh, electric stimulus to the mind as being indistinguishable from, a, from an experience. That perhaps that has to do not, is, it, is, is that impression due perhaps to a, the person's lack of discernment? Maybe a more discerning brain or human being would be able to um, tell the difference. Okay, so the, the first one, by in, an intersubjectivity, do you mean, say, sort of shared cultural assumptions, so sort of a common way of seeing the world that uh, proliferates through a culture and that might differ from one culture to another? No, I think I mean something more, um, more mysterious. For example, when you can feel another person's thought or feeling, you know, mm -hmm. these types of coincidences people yes. talk about. And also the way those are misused in, in group think or in, in, in mobs of people suddenly becoming influenced by a, a demagogue, you know, that they're, yeah. they lose the control of their own minds. They become invaded by a, another way of thinking. Yeah, there certainly is a, a mob psychology or group psychology, uh, as when, a, say, during a riot when uh, people can kind of lose their individuality and feel sort of compelled to do what everyone around them is, is doing. Um, I don't think it's mysterious in the sense of you know, synchronicity or, or some kind of um, Jungian collective unconscious. Uh, uh, I think it's mediated by social signals from one individual to another. But it is an interesting aspect of our psychology that, that we can lose ourselves in, in a group. Um, in terms of the, uh, and the second question was, remind me. Electrical oh, oh, I see. Well, it's, um, uh, you know, I think that people can, at a cognitive level, know, well, here I am, I'm sitting here in this chair, and there's, my, my skull is open, and there's a guy there sticking an, a, uh, an electrode into my brain. I'm probably not at my ninth birthday party right now, uh, but it sure <laughs> feels like I am. Uh, so I think there is this sort of separate cognitive level that in some cases can distinguish between the hallucination and the real state of affairs. Um, but on the other hand, there are also cases that we know from, from brain damage where the person doesn't have those cues of the, you know, the neurosurgeon and the, the whole team, where people really are deluded uh, about what they are and are not feeling. Because the relevant cues would be, part of my brain is missing. But since we are our brains, when a part is missing, most of the time we have no way of knowing. And you can have often shocking confabulations uh, of people with brain damage precisely because the external cue of the, of the surgeon, say, or the drug that you remember taking is not available. Oliver Sacks writes very uh, um, uh, eloquently about that, such as the, the uh, person who um, no longer felt that his leg uh, was part of his body and uh, thought that the doctors have put someone else's leg in his bed. Even though at the cognitive level you would think he would say, well, here I am in a you know, neurology ward and I, they tell, tell me I've suffered a stroke. This must be uh, a hallucination but, uh, or a, a, a confabulation. But very often people with brain damage are unable to step outside themselves and recognize that a compelling feeling uh, is a product of a damaged brain. That's how compelling it is. To give you just another example of um, a set of syndromes, typically going along with right hemisphere damage, where a, um, a woman who, who had, a, had a stroke and um, was paralyzed and refused to acknowledge that she was paralyzed because the paralysis wasn't from, say, a spinal cord injury where the brain is intact and can... Um, recognize the disparity between the thought and the physical action. But if the damage is actually in the brain, and since we are our brain, the faculty of knowing that it must be our own infirmity can itself be damaged. And so uh, a, a woman denied that there was anything wrong with her and um, 
uh, would just weave a coherent story as to everything about her, like why there are crutches. Oh, well, I, uh, you know, I, my leg was a little bit weak this morning, so I needed the crutches. Well, you know, aren't, don't you recognize you're here in a nursing home? You're not at home. Oh, yes, well, it's, uh, we, we, it just looks like a nursing home. We rearranged the furniture. Well, do you have a, an elevator in your house? Oh, you wouldn't believe what it costs to have that installed. And she would rearrange reality, her conception of reality, to be consistent with the fact that nothing was wrong with her. And this often happens, and it shows that, that um, indeed, there are cases where the sense of discernment itself, being a brain function, can be impaired. Yes? You mentioned um, the vilification of those who are successful. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you also talk about um, well, it seems like it's a random distribution of capability that humans have as a species. And so I wonder about uh, if you could discuss poverty and the amount of gray matter that goes unused and how this, how your book or your findings may, could affect social policy. Yes, well, in the book I make it very clear that I, um, don't, int I, I don't argue for particular social policies um, because I don't think that's that the discoveries about uh, the, the biology of the brain or of, of genes or of evolution have uh, automatically lead to social policies, simply because any social policy that's worth debating will, will involve some trade-off between uh, the um, competing goods. And that I think the best that science can do is illuminate what the trade-off is, but how to resolve the trade-off uh, is up to ordinary debate in a, in a democracy. So let's say in the case of uh, economic equality or inequality, the fact that people uh, might differ partly genetically uh, in traits that could lead to greater or, or less uh, economic success, say ambition, intelligence, uh, and so on, um, doesn't, does it mean that, well, uh, we should tolerate whatever inequality we find because it's, uh, it's in the genes and uh, it, in a completely fair system you expect some inequality? Well, not necessarily because um, eliminating visible signs of inequality is itself a, could be a social goal, uh, separate from uh, strict fairness and freedom. And one has to trade off being in a society in which you uh, less a fair society in which all you do is level the playing field and let people end up wherever they end up, and the good of reducing suffering of the of poorer people who may, by no choice of their own, end up having trouble making a living. Uh, and there's no way in which these competing goods of say maximum freedom or maximum equality can be satisfied at the same time. So you could and you could I think array political philosophies in terms of how they resolve that trade-off. An extreme, say, Ayn Rand-style libertarianism would say that the only value is freedom and to heck with, with uh, inequality of outcome. Um, a, say, a Maoist or Stalinist ph philosophy would say, to heck with freedom, what's important is everyone end up the same and it doesn't matter how much we suppress individuals to end up that way. And then most Philosoph political philosophies that we debate are somewhere in between. How much freedom should we trade off for a reduction in inequality or a reduction in the uh, suffering of, of uh, poorer people? And um, so my argument is not that um, the, uh, any discoveries about heritability should dictate what our political choices are, but just they make the choices a little bit clearer. Yes. Thank you for speaking tonight. Um, I, I'm sure you've been asked this question before, but one of the implications of linking human behavior to almost a physical component, either of the brain or the genetics, um, is that medical treatments can be suggested for aberrant behavior, and examples of this might be depression or um, you know, the ability to focus. And so what would be, I guess, your opinion on treatments like drug treatments versus therapeutic treatments in this sort of situation and kind of the concept of almost medical perfectibility of behavior or human nature. Yeah. Well, I think that um, the, uh, first of all, we just, we have to know what, what the facts are, namely what are the um, side effects of, of pharmaceutical uh, interventions um, and in, often there will be side effects and so it's again a kind of cost benefit trade-off. I think if there is a, meta, a, a pharmaceutical intervention that 
reduces suffering, say alleviates depression uh, or anxiety or attention disorder and has no um, side effects, or the side effects are outweighed by the benefits, then people should have the freedom of, uh, of using them. Um, but it's an empirical question, say in the case of depression, whether uh, simply taking a pill is better than, say, taking a pill and undergoing uh, therapy, or for that matter, undergoing therapy alone. There I would simply be kind of an empiricist and say, let's look at the statistics as to what works. My understanding is in the case of depression, drugs and therapy are more effective than either one alone. And I would provide, hope that people would be provided the, with the information of what works to what extent and could make their choices accordingly. One more. Yeah. Hi. A uh, difficult problem in computer science, one of the more difficult ones, has been a random number generator, making a very good one of those. And the, at first glance, it can seem like a contradiction in terms. A computer needs a set list of instructions that it will perform the same way every time, and yet it's supposed to come up with, to our mind, something different every time, a different number. And the random number generators I've seen have always relied fundamentally on a human input at the very beginning, and then it'll multiply by three, divide by seven, et cetera. So the belief is that the ghost in the machine can come up with a pure, spontaneous, random number, the seed, and then the computer programmer, the computer program can take over from there. But if neuroscience seems to be seeing that the brain is just another kind of computer, is that negating the idea of whim or spontaneity, that there is no such thing as random bursts Mm -hmm. that we can direct, too. Not that just come because someone hit me in the hammer, but because I say, I want my random number to be five. Things like that. Yeah, so who's, who's the eye that provides the seed to the pseudo-random number generator? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's, you know, we, we don't know enough I mean, that in cases where human behavior really is unpredictable and it looks like a coin is being flipped, um, it's possible that, like the first computer that I ever used uh, when I was an undergraduate. This was a, uh, a PDP-11 mini computer where we needed, the lab needed a um, generate random sequences and it didn't have the computational power to do a proper pseudo-random uh, approximation. And so there was a gadget that had a little bit of um, some kind of radioactive substance, I don't know if it was radium, and a little Geiger counter and it actually used the physical indeterminacy to generate the random numbers. It's possible that in the human brain there are uh, quantum level interactions so that a, whether a neurotransmitter molecule zigs instead of zags could be due to some kind of ultimately quantum event that gets amplified, or it could be some kind of nonlinearity, uh, some sort of chaotic system where some very minuscule infinitesimal difference in the initial conditions can set the brain off in one direction or another. It wouldn't, again, wouldn't be truly random, but it would be the functional equivalent of random. And it may begin, the seed may be, were you, you know, this way in your mother's womb or that way in your mother's womb? Or did your, you know, did your mom, uh, you know, jog for one mile or two miles uh, on a particular day? Um, so I think the indeterminacy, to the extent that there is indeterminacy, and, you know, as I mentioned in the case of the cars coming down the highway, we hope that in many cases of human behavior there is not indeterminacy, but the indeterminacy that there is, uh, like should I order chocolate or vanilla, could come from physical processes with a random seed of either of those uh, uh, events. Okay, why don't we take one more? I was fascinated by, um, in the nature, nurture debate about the your injection of the role of chance. So this kind of follow-up question to the one you were just addressing, and I was hoping you could expand a little bit on uh, some of the ways in which uh, chance events play a role in our psyche and perhaps even in psychopathology, uh, for example, yeah. in adults. Well, so here are some of the possibilities. I mean, again, the, just to make it very clear, the datum that we're trying to explain is as follows. Identical twins reared together uh, typically correlate maybe, let's say, 0.5, uh, that is less than 100%. Now, they share their genes and they share their environment, or at least most of their environment. Um, this refutes just about every theory in the history of psychology uh, because there's this huge percentage of the variance that's neither heredity nor measurable environment. Here are some of the possibilities. Chance events in the development of the brain in utero or in the first uh, few years of life while the brain is still developing such as the ones that I just mentioned, does a, a growth cone of an axon go left or go right? 
um, chance events in, in uh, uh, other biological events, do, do you inhale a virus or does a vi virus get purchased in your cells or get just uh, surrounded by the immune system? And it's possible that some of the missing variants in diseases and pathology could come from pathogens. Um, chance events, do you, uh, in, throughout your life, you, you pick up a brochure and some field that you never knew about turns you on and you decide from that moment on that you've always wanted to be a you know, cognitive psychologist or a trapeze <laughs> artist. Uh, you bump into someone and they say something and you, th you think about it and you, know, you think some more about it and you do something that sets you off in a direction and then that kind of puts you on a groove that leads you farther and farther apart from your identical twin who didn't have that conversation. Um, so these are some of the possibilities that could add up cultural chance events, uh, really a whole panoply of different uh, Yes, uh, exactly. I mean, probably a larger role than has ever been acknowledged, as far as you're concerned. Exactly. And some of the corroboration of, of that suspicion comes from studies of development in um, laboratory organisms, such as uh, C. elegans, the roundworm, or Drosophila, the fruit fly, which shows that in highly inbred strains, which are the equivalent of clones or, or identical twins, um, brought up in monotonous, highly controlled laboratory conditions, same temperature and salinity and so on, you can have organisms that are physically different, um, uh, that can have different uh, numbers of bristles under one wing or under another wing. In the case of uh, roundworms, um, you can have differences in longevity of a factor of three. And as one um, longevity specialist studying C. elegans pointed out that the variation in the lifespan of uh, genetically homogeneous roundworms brought up in laboratory conditions is the same as what we find in human beings living a variety of lifestyles, neglecting or taking care of their health, uh, bumping into enraged postal workers, eating tainted beef. Uh, all of these vagaries of human life give us variance in our life in our lifespan which is the same as basically the equivalent of clones growing up in a monotonous laboratory so chance if it has that much of an effect in an organism that's only composed of 959 cells imagine how chance could operate in an organism of, of trillions of cells <laughs>